Families all over the world send their children off to school each morning, confident they'll be watched over throughout the day until they return home safely. But on April 12, 2016, this was not the case for 16-year-old Michaela Bali. When Michaela's grandmother dropped her off at Sacred Heart High School that morning, no one could have predicted that by day's end, Michaela would be reported as a missing person. Security footage of Michaela recorded at 12.02 p.m. that afternoon would become the last confirmed sighting of the teenager in nearly four years. In this video, we'll examine the unusual and heartbreaking disappearance of Michaela Bali and explore the most intriguing theories about why and how she vanished. In April 2016, Michaela was a 16-year-old student at Sacred Heart High School in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. Michaela lived with her mother, Paula Bali, her maternal grandmother, Margaret, and her two younger siblings, Joshua and Eliora. Michaela's friends describe her as quiet but popular, sweet, sometimes shy and a good listener. She loved music and reading. She also played violin and had become interested in the drama program at her school. Michaela was a big fan of the Hunger Games series and video games like League of Legends and had hoped to become a teacher or a vet, inspired by her love of both children and animals. Michaela was, according to her mother, an ordinary teenager, which made her disappearance all the more extraordinary. Paula would later tell investigators that nothing unusual had happened in the hours before Michaela vanished. In the morning, Paula and Michaela put on makeup and listened to music together in the bathroom, chatting casually about their upcoming days, before getting into the car with Michaela's grandmother, Margaret Niebergall, who usually drove Michaela to school and Paula to work. Margaret dropped Michaela off at Sacred Heart High School between 8.10 and 8.20 a.m. When Margaret returned to the school in the afternoon to pick Michaela up, the teenager wasn't waiting for her. When Margaret went into the school to look for her granddaughter, she was told that teachers and friends hadn't seen Michaela for much of the day. Margaret drove to Paula's office and informed her that Michaela was not at school. Paula first wondered if her daughter had left early to go to a music lesson she had scheduled. She had a violin recital coming up and had been practicing for it just the night before, but Michaela wasn't at her lesson either. Back at their home, Paula checked a cash fund she kept at the house in case of emergencies. Michaela had access to the money, and if she'd planned to run away, Paula thought she would have taken it with her. But the cash had not been touched. That evening, Paula reported her daughter missing to the Yorkton Royal Canadian Mounted Police. By the next morning, investigators were beginning to trace Michaela's movements before her disappearance. Family had been trying to reach Michaela since realizing something was wrong, but by 7 a.m. on April 13th, her phone had been turned off. Over the next several months, thanks to footage from security cameras, cell phone records, and the cooperation of Michaela's friends and family, a comprehensive timeline was assembled following Michaela's activities on April 12th. Michaela had walked into school after her grandmother dropped her off. She had logged on to Sacred Heart High School's Wi-Fi network around 8.08 a.m., but by 8.26, the 16-year-old had exited Sacred Heart through a back entrance. Michaela was next seen on a surveillance camera at a nearby convenience store. The footage showed her walking along local railroad tracks. She made her way to a TD Bank branch, arriving there before the bank opened its doors. She waited outside, talking on her phone, then hung up and went inside at 8.55. She withdrew $55 from her bank account. Michaela then walked to a nearby pawn shop, Terry's Pawn and Bargain. The owner, Terry Hedden, reported that Michaela wanted to find out the value of a silver ring. Hedden told her the ring wasn't valuable enough for him to buy from her. Hedden said Michaela didn't seem upset or in distress, she just left the shop. Michaela's next stop was a combination of a Tim Hortons Wendy's restaurant, where surveillance cameras recorded her buying a drink and taking a seat in a booth, facing away from the entrance. With her backpack beside her, Michaela sat in the booth and used her phone for around 13 minutes, turning every so often to look toward the restaurant's doors. Oddly, she appeared to take her phone apart and reassemble it during this period. At 9.23, Michaela left the restaurant through one of the exits, but immediately turned back to walk through the area again and use a different exit. A hardware store's surveillance camera showed her walking north until she was out of frame. 
but around 20 minutes later, at 9.42, she appeared on the camera again and made her way back to Tim Hortons. When she walked back inside the restaurant, she appeared to be on a phone call. She chose a new seat at a booth closer to the window, and this time she sat facing the doors. At 10.12 a.m., Michaela sent a text to her friend Shelby Natuk, one that puzzles investigators and Michaela's family to this day. It read, Hey, I need help. Within half an hour, Michaela texted Shelby again, Never mind, I figured it out. A short time later, Michaela left the restaurant a second time, only to come back in again after just a couple of minutes. She took another phone call and looked expectantly around the restaurant at 10.39. By 10.43, she had hung up and approached an older woman sitting at a nearby table. That woman told police that Michaela had asked for her help too, specifically if the woman would help her rent a hotel room. Michaela didn't name a particular hotel. The woman told Michaela no, and the teenager returned to her seat and made yet another phone call. Just a few minutes later, she left the restaurant for the final time. Michaela walked back to Sacred Heart High School texting Shelby, I'll see you at lunch, and arrived at the school at 11.59 a.m. While there, she reportedly told two fellow students that she was going to take a bus to the city of Regina for a vacation. By 12.02 p.m., Michaela was seen walking back out of Sacred Heart. Surveillance footage captured her rounding a corner and disappearing from view as she walked away from the school. These are the last known images of Michaela Bali. Though security footage of Michaela only confirms her whereabouts until 12.02 p.m., eyewitness accounts next placed her at the Trail Stop restaurant about a mile from her school. The restaurant is connected to a bus station, and witnesses there saw Michaela buy and eat poutine for lunch. An employee at the bus depot remembered speaking with Michaela, who wanted to know what time the bus to Regina was leaving. The employee told her at 5 p.m., but said Michaela didn't purchase a ticket. Michaela reportedly left the Trail Stop restaurant around 1.45 p.m. While the surveillance footage and text messages gathered by investigators provided a very clear picture of what Michaela had been doing the day she disappeared, they also raised many questions. Michaela had obviously spoken with someone, possibly more than one person, on the phone throughout the morning, and her behavior in Tim Hortons indicated she may have been waiting for somebody. She asked for help renting a hotel room, but then told classmates she planned to take a bus out of town. What exactly was Michaela's plan that day? Paula Bali maintains that her daughter was not the type to run away from home, and nothing Michaela would need for a trip was missing from the Bali house. Her makeup, phone charger, and medicine were all left behind. But revelations from Michaela's friends complicated the case even further. On April 11, 2016, the day before she went missing, Michaela had gone to a fast food restaurant for lunch with Shelby Natuk and another friend, Oksana Yakachuk. Shelby and Oksana later told investigators that at lunch, Michaela spoke about traveling somewhere such as Moose Jaw or Prince Albert, or possibly Saskatoon, all cities within Saskatchewan. Shelby also asked Michaela on April 11 about a boy named Josh, whom Michaela had talked about before, but Michaela did not respond. Another classmate of Michaela's, Amy Liang, told investigators that Michaela had told her a man named Christopher was traveling to the province to meet her. After school on April 11th at 4.35 p.m., Michaela texted Oksana and asked for a ride to the bank the following day. According to phone records, Michaela also called TD Bank's customer service line three separate times that evening, checking her balance and making a transfer of $25. Throughout the evening of April 11th, Michaela texted Shelby, Amy, and an ex-boyfriend. She asked Amy for help, a sentiment she would echo the following day in her text to Shelby, but didn't respond when Amy asked her to explain. Her texts to Shelby and her ex-boyfriend were about being unhappy. She told her ex she was thinking about spending a few days in Regina. Finally, on the morning of her disappearance, at 6.41 a.m., Michaela texted Oksana, Can you take me to the bank? Asking for help once again with the errand she would end up completing on foot after she left Sacred Heart High School. Why was it so important to Michaela to visit the bank the day she went missing? 
If she was contemplating a trip out of town, as she suggested to some of her friends, her withdrawal of $55 wouldn't get her very far. And why would she leave behind essentials such as makeup and medication if her intention was to board a bus and head to a different city? In the nearly four years since Michaela was last seen, no concrete answers to these questions have been found. Since 2016, Michaela Bali's case has gained attention across Canada and even in the United States, with many online sleuths speculating about where she may have gone, with whom, and where she might be today. A popular theory is that Michaela had been communicating with someone online and was planning to meet that person on April 12, 2016. Even Paula Bali said of the Tim Hortons security footage, This is absolutely unusual behavior for Michaela. It seemed like she was waiting for someone. Shelby Natuk told CBC News that Michaela had connected with people online in the past. She remembered at least four, but said the interactions never lasted too long. She recalled, quote, I never liked the idea of her messaging guys online because it's kind of sketchy, but she wouldn't listen to me. She did her own thing. Shortly before she disappeared, Michaela had told her friend Oksana that she had $5,000 in her bank account, but records show she had a much smaller amount. Some have theorized that Michaela's preoccupation with getting to the bank that day, as well as checking her balance the night before, may have been because she was waiting for someone to deposit money into her account to help her leave Yorkton. In a huge setback for the investigation, the phone calls Michaela made throughout the morning of April 12th didn't register on her TELUS mobile network account. This is usually the case when calls are made through social media apps. Michaela's friends reported that she used apps to communicate, including Snapchat and Instagram, and possibly Kik, an anonymous messaging app. Messaging platforms like Kik have become popular in recent years, but their anonymous nature and lack of parental controls have made them an attractive method for predators looking to communicate with possible victims. U.S. privacy laws often prevent the chat logs on these apps from being released, which can be a setback for investigations. It's even been suggested that Michaela may have been in possession of a second cell phone, possibly provided to her by someone she was planning to meet as a way to avoid detection. Similarly, neither the trail stop restaurant nor the bus station had security cameras, something a predator might have taken into consideration when planning to meet a young girl. The investigation briefly led to a man named Rick Bright, who lives in Saskatoon and believes he may be Michaela's father, though this has never been confirmed. Police got in touch with him by phone just days after Michaela disappeared, and a few months later, they visited his home to search and take DNA samples, but officials have said that no evidence points to Bright being involved in Michaela's disappearance. As for Michaela's mother, some online sleuths have wondered if Michaela's home life was as typical as Paula had claimed. Pointing to the family's possible money problems and the lack of a father figure in Michaela's life, some have suggested that the Bali family was struggling and Michaela chose to leave home. The RCMP have never named a suspect in this case, but they have released information about a person of interest, reportedly seen at the Trail Stop restaurant when Michaela was there. The man has a large tattoo of a cross on his forearm and the RCMP hope to identify him with the public's help. Though sightings of young women matching Michaela's description have trickled in over the years, a possible sighting in August 2019 infused the investigation with new hope. A man called Paula Bali on August 8th and told her he believes he spoke to Michaela in Edmonton, Alberta, more than 500 miles from Yorkton. The man reported that he spoke to a young woman for a few minutes outside a pool hall called High Run Club in March of 2019. When he saw a social media post about Michaela sometime later, he recognized her. Unfortunately, there is no surveillance footage from this reported encounter. The club does have security cameras, but by the time the man reported his sighting of Michaela, the footage from that day had already been taped over. The man told Paula that the woman he spoke to seemed naive and sweet and out of place in the rough area, like she didn't belong there. Paula says this description matches Michaela, telling media outlets, She's a very gentle soul and she comes across that way. Paula reported the tip to the RCMP. Social media is at the center of this case, and Michaela's accounts remain intact, frozen in time. Before she disappeared, she had an Instagram account that featured plenty of selfies and photos with her friends, but another account reportedly exists under her name.
This profile has many followers but no photos. The About Me section consists of one word, goodbye. Shelby sent Michaela a message on Snapchat the day she went missing. Three months later, Shelby saw the message had been read. She sent another message on graduation day, when Michaela should have been at the ceremony with her. That message has never been opened. Paula Bali continues to diligently search for anyone who might have information about her daughter's whereabouts. There's a 50,000 Canadian dollar reward for Michaela's safe return to her family. What do you believe happened to Michaela Bali? Did she perfectly plan and execute her own disappearance? Or did she walk out of the Trail Stop restaurant and into harm's way? Did someone help her get out of Yorkton? And above all, where is she now? Share your theories and thoughts in the comments below.